Welcome to the AIAA Space Resources what, Education Outreach Webinar Series. I'm Jared Longfox. Uh, today, we have Dr. Hannah Sargent, um, who's at the University of Leicester, at, so a research fellow in the UK. Um, she used to be here at UCF and has been involved in a myriad of things throughout her long and storied career. Um, and I'll let her cover some more of that. So without further ado, Hannah, uh, welcome and thank you for your time. I look forward to your talk. Thank you very much. Okay, let's see if I can share the screen. Um, okay. Can I confirm you can see this? I can see this. If you just go into presentation mode, we will be great. Perfect. Oh, yep. Excellent. Okay. Right. Let me start from the beginning, shall I? <laughs> okay. So I'm going to be talking um, today about sourcing lunar oxygen. Um, often I will interchange oxygen and water. And this is because, to be honest, they are quite interchangeable in terms of when we see water, on the moon that means we can access the oxygen so um yeah excuse me when i interchange between the two um and i'll be dipping in and out of a number of different research areas and themes that i've been involved in over the last few years which has predominantly been um space resources on the moon and um, looking for oxygen and water okay so i'm going to start out by looking at why are we so interested in lunar oxygen? And then where we can find it. And spoiler alert, um, that's gonna be in two types, two main types um, in uh, on the moon, that'll be oxygen from ice and also oxygen from the regolith itself. Um, and then I'll talk a bit about how we might extract it from those two different sources. And then looking more at um, some of the exploration efforts and some of the prospectors and prospecting missions, which help us to understand the material um, so that we can better design our extraction techniques. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about some demonstrators and some demonstrator missions, um, which demonstrate some of these extraction techniques in the local environment itself on the moon, but also some of the developments that, that have been made in some of these demonstrator technologies on some Earth analogs. Um, then I'll look at some of the challenges involved in scaling up some of these technologies to get really meaningful amounts of, um, of oxygen on the moon. Um, and then finally, just a, a quick kind of rundown of some of the questions you really need to be asking yourself and your team when looking at what extraction method am I going to use um, to to source my oxygen? OK, so from the top, I always like to start with this sort of schematic, which is looking at the sort of uh, moon to Mars roadmap. Um, and this is a major uh, this is a major focus of human space exploration. Um, so in in recent years, a lot of crewed exploration has been much closer to Earth in terms of um, being and uh, being on the International Space Station. But a lot of that is actually enabling some of this um, exploration further out into the solar system. So on on the International Space Station, we've been looking at how to keep a crew alive for prolonged periods of time um, with relatively minimal resupply efforts from Earth. So can they recycle their water supplies and, and generate enough oxygen to breathe and um, 3D printing some of the tools that they might use. And a lot of this technology is actually going to be used um, to support uh, prolonged uh, missions on the lunar surface, maybe some human tended lunar bases or, or, or orbiters, and ultimately getting us to Mars so that we can very much live off the land uh, because getting supplies from Earth when you're operating on Mars is not an easy task. We're, we're, we're talking best case scenario, a six month mission from launch date to getting that supply onto the surface. So really, you need to be able to um, survive with what you have around you. So we can actually use the moon to help us um, develop a lot of these technologies and use it as a sort of test bed for extracting um, local resources and using them to, to support a human uh, crewed base. Um, but one of the things I really want to touch on is how these exploration efforts and, and sourcing these resources really goes hand in hand with the scientific um, value of going to these different destinations. OK, we're not just exploring for the sake of exploring. It's really important that we consider um, 
what what are some of the main benefits of going so we can better understand the evolution of the solar system um the evolution of the earth moon system um the water cycle on airless bodies these are all things that we're trying to better understand and we can do that with our crude exploration um but it's important that we don't just disregard some of these um some of these goals when we go and start harvesting our resources um and finally one of the uh, additional benefits of operating on the moon is it we can actually use it as a sort of a launch pad to get us onwards to Mars. And that's because of something called um, a gravity well. OK, so this is a really nice schematic that I like from XKCD. And it shows you just how much energy it takes to escape the gravity well of Earth compared to the gravity well of the moon. So a gravity well is basically the amount of demonstrates how much energy you need to escape the gravity um, of an object. So Earth being more massive means it takes a lot more energy to escape Earth's gravity than it does to escape the moon's gravity. So this is why it took a huge rocket to get to the moon, but only a small one to get back. So what this means is um, we want to uh, source some of our really heavy materials and materials that we use a lot of like our rocket fuel and our water. If we can source that on the moon and then launch that into space, ultimately that will be a lot more economical than launching all of those heavy um, materials from Earth, okay? So what we want to end up doing possibly is actually using the, the moon as a sort of a fuel stop. So you can launch your crew from Earth, you could rendezvous with your fuel supply from the moon and then head onwards to Mars. And then once you're at Mars, do your operations and whatever, and then resupply again with a fuel station that you might have there, um, and then coming on home again. And when I say fuel or propellant, I basically mean oxygen, okay? So um, hydrogen and oxygen are really common um, rocket propellants that we can use. Um, hydrogen is a lot lighter than oxygen. So oxygen is really this resource that we want to get hold of because we're going to use a lot of oxygen um, in our rocket propellant uh, and it's and it's a consumable, so it will get used up. So we need to generate quite large amounts of it. Um, but we can also use that oxygen for life support needs for um, and also water in the form of you know agriculture and again, um, to keep our crew alive. So water and oxygen are going to be these really critical resources um, for the next few years and one of the primary resources we want to target um, in terms of isru and, and space resource utilization okay so where is this resource where are we going to find this oxygen well the first one i want to talk about is oxygen in the form of ice in the form of water ice okay so this is a nice image um, produced by ESA, which is an overlay of some um, ice maps that have been produced on top of um, the south polar region of the moon and what it shows us is that there's really high concentrations of water ice in these cratered regions um, and there's a lot of evidence that tells us that we've got spectra from um, from hydrogen from water we've got albedo that tells us that some areas um, are smoother which suggests perhaps there's ice compared to um, the regolith and rubble um, we've also got uh, temperature measurements that tells us that ice is stable in these cratered regions. Um, and most importantly, we've actually got some uh, detection of water from a plume that was produced when we, uh, we sent a spent rocket stage into one of the South Polar craters and 5% water was actually detected in the plume that was ejected. Um, but models and different data suggest there could be water concentrations up to around 30 weight percent. Um, but we just don't know yet because we haven't landed in one of these craters. OK, so getting into these areas is actually quite complex. Um, so we still don't quite understand the form of the ice, how it's distributed, um, how uniformly it's distributed. Um, so, yeah, there's a lot more work that needs to be done to understand this resource. And I just want to talk about um, why, firstly, why this ice is forming and why it's so difficult to get to. And it's all to do with the fact that the sun is so low in the sky in these polar regions. So on the left here, I've just got um, a little schematic showing um, the sun is always very low in these polar regions. So you might have some illuminated crater rims, but there'll be areas that never, ever see sunlight and they are constantly cryogenic and they're called permanently shadowed regions. So this on the right is a nice... Um, a nice image showing how uh, as the sun moves across the sky, there are some areas within the craters that never get to see that sunlight. Um, so it's, it's permanently cold 
So if there's ever any water that happens to be local, any water molecules, and they strike that cold surface, they are going to condense there. They're going to stick there. And over billions of years, these water ice deposits um, will collect into quite meaningful amounts. Um, but the problem is these water deposits are in the bottom of craters. Um, they are in areas that don't have sunlight and they're extremely cold. So trying to operate in that really extreme environment is quite challenging. So this is why uh, we haven't yet um, sent any rovers or landers into these shadowed craters. Okay, so another potential source of oxygen then is actually the regolith itself in its driest form. Okay, so we've just got an example here zoomed in of, um, of the different minerals that you might find in, in your regolith. Um, and here we've just got uh, a breakdown of what is the composition of these different minerals. And you can see that oxygen is a really large component of a lot of these minerals. Um, in fact, it's oxygen is about, I think it's more than 40% by mass of the minerals on the moon. Um, but extracting it is quite challenging because it is literally bound up in these mineral structures. So trying to extract it requires breaking those bonds, which is quite energy intensive. Um, but regolith is everywhere. So we're not limited by the, um, the extreme environmental conditions that you might find in the shadowed regions. Okay, this this um, this example here is something I'm, I'm only going to dip uh, dip into, um, but it's an example of another source of um, water on the moon, uh, not one that we might harvest, but it is of scientific interest, and I think they're just quite interesting. So these are pyroclastic deposits, and these are formed relatively early on in the moon's history when it was still cooling down, and molten material from the interior of the moon would actually um, erupt in quite violent fire fountains, they call them. Um, and because there's no tangible atmosphere um, on the moon's surface, it would instantly cool. And when you cool that quickly, we say it's quenched and it turns into these fine glass beads and it actually captures any volatiles that might be present in that molten material when it's beneath the surface. And it, these um, pyroclastic deposits, you can see them from um, from orbit. So here's a nice image on the left showing um, what a pyroclastic deposit might look like. Um, and on the right hand side is actually a picture on the lunar surface taken by one of the Apollo astronauts. And the orange material is the is a pyroclastic deposit. So um, you can actually form different colored pyroclastic deposits. You can have oranges or greens. And this is down to the titanium content within it. Um, but within these glass beads, they've actually sampled them and measured water, uh, which tells us that there was actually water present, um, or we can we can we can tell how much water was present in the interior of the moon um, during its formation, um, which is definitely of scientific interest, but unfortunately um, isn't really something that we could um, harvest any large amounts of uh, water from. Okay, so how might we extract some of this water or, or oxygen? So if we're gonna extract oxygen from the ice, one of the most common techniques that you might use is thermal extraction. And there's loads of different ways that you might do that. And it's simply applying heat to the icy regolith. Um, and then that ice is converted into water vapor. And then you can collect that on some sort of cold surface or cold trap where it will recondense and you can store your water. Um, and then later on, you can perform some sort of electrolysis to separate the hydrogen and oxygen if you do just want that, that pure oxygen extracted. Um, and there's a number of different techniques that I'll dig into, but there's also um, another way you can extract um, oxygen from ice, and that's using some mechanical processes um, where you separate the ice from the other regolith minerals whilst it's still in the solid state. So you're actually treating the ice just like another mineral and using uh, pneumatics and other separation techniques, um, looking at um, the difference in the ratio of inertial forces or the aerodynamic drag of the different minerals to actually separate them out. But some of these processes um, need to be, um, I suppose, calibrated on the, the, the form of icy regolith that you're expected to find, but we don't actually know the form of icy regolith that we're gonna find. So here's just some examples here in this figure um, of how ice could be integrated in the regolith matrix. 
Um, so some techniques might be better than others at separating the ice um, from those minerals. Okay, so now let's take a look at some of these different types of um, thermal mining. Um, in the simplest form really is surface heating, so applying heat to the surface of the regolith. And then if there's any ice present, that will sublimate and you can then try and collect that in some sort of tent on the surface. Um, and those water molecules can then be collected in a cold trap. Um, a technique that has been looked at quite a lot is using uh, reflected sunlight or um, concentrated sunlight. For example, you might have some um, uh, heliostats on the crater rims, which will then focus some of that sunlight into your shadowed crater. And you'd have to have um, this system operating within the shadows, um, which sounds rather creepy, but yeah, it would need to operate and have power and be able to operate in that cold environment and move around to your different target sites um, before then hauling your ice out to wherever it needs to go. So this can involve quite a complex infrastructure if you need um, if you need to have these heliostats on the crater rims um, and you're limited by the amount of sunlight available. So on the order of around a thousand watts per meter squared, but you could concentrate that sunlight, you could have more um, more reflectors, but again, with that comes significantly more infrastructure in multiple different landing sites. Um, another um, type of surface heating I want to touch on is using some sort of heated plate. So it doesn't have to be, um, you know, direct sunlight. It can be some other power that you use um, to generate your heat. So you might have um, electrical heaters charged by batteries that you might have charged out um, in a sunlit region, but you can also use um, radioisotope power systems. And I do want to touch on this briefly because in my current role, I'm actually working a lot on, um, on a radioisotope power program here in the UK using alternative radioisotopes. Um, and often I'm finding that uh, a lot of ISRU technologies or concepts are um, are designed around a solar power source and that might not always be feasible um, and it really and it can limit your design choices so I just want to highlight that there, there are alternatives that you might want to consider especially when we're, we're looking at this smaller scale prospecting kind of scales um, so here we've just got a very rudimentary sort of uh, rover design here with uh, using the waste heat from a radioisotope power system um, to heat the regolith below the rover. You might have some tent included um, beneath the rover to collect your volatiles onto a cold trap, and then you can rove along onto your next destination. And one of the benefits of this is that you don't need to go and recharge in sunlight and then come back into the crater. So you can actually operate continuously in the shadowed uh, regions, which means you can actually go many kilometers into, uh, into that area without having to uh, recharge and be limited by um, how close you are to, to sunlight. Okay, so um, moving on to another type of uh, thermal mining, we've got rod heaters that have been suggested a number of times. So you might have an array of heated rods that you then bury into the regolith and apply heat. Again, you might have some sort of collection tent above it. Um, but there are some models that suggest that some of that these water molecules, once they're um, once they sublimate, they might um, be pushed outwards into this, the sides and, and, and the lower regolith layers. Um, so it may not be that efficient at, um, at collecting. So you might have to adapt your uh, rod heater arrays accordingly to try and um, to better collect or redirect some of that, that water. Um, but again, looking at how you might um, heat these rods, you could use um, electric heaters or s somehow redirecting solar into your mining area. Um, yeah, so don't be limited by what your power source might be. Um, another type of rod heater that I want to mention is actually an auger heater, um, because this type of system is actually used um, or is being considered and being integrated into future lunar rover drills. Um, so an auger heater is basically a drill which collects the regolith inside the drill bit um, and then you can apply heat to it and then the water that's that's uh, released can then be collected and redirected to your cold trap. Um, and one of the benefits of this is that most of that water is going to be collected 
but it's a very small scale system. So great for prospecting, but not the kind of system I can imagine on a super large scale. Um, and this is a this is just a design um, that was suggested using the MMRTG, for example. Um, another type of thermal mining is actually microwave heating. This is quite a novel um, use of, of microwave heating. So this is some work being done uh, by James Cole, a PhD student at the Open University, um, and using uh, relatively low power microwave um, heating around 200 watts um, to liberate some of the, those water molecules. And one of the benefits of this is that you can actually um, focus your microwaves to um, to an area much lower in the regolith um, instead of just that that upper surface and, and it um, and it will heat up a much larger volume um, but there is a lot of work to be done to take this technology which is kind of demonstrating that microwaves can be used on icy regolith to actually developing some sort of prototype that could you know be used in field tests or on demonstrator missions um, and then just touching on this um, mechanical separation process. So this is work that has been um, uh, led by Phil Metzger. Um, and this is a, a patent that, I, that I've taken a look at. So you've got, for example, you might have your, your robot that digs up or excavates your regolith and crushes it up to a, a consistent sort of grain size. Um, and then you might have some sort of separation system using pneumatics or cyclones. And then another level of separation using um, looking at magnetics or electrostatics. So it's taking all of these physical properties of the different mineral fragments and the ice fragments and separating them accordingly. Um, so before I move on to the next type of um, oxygen extraction, I wanted to just highlight some of the access and power issues that you're going to face when trying to um, harvest some of this ice. Um, so the problem is, is that you want to access ice, which is at the bottom of a crater and you probably want to use that water or that oxygen somewhere else so you need to be able to travel traverse down crater slopes and back up crater slopes um, you're going to have some technologies that need to operate in sunlight that then migrate into the shadowed areas and can survive that extreme uh, uh, environmental change um, and then some sort of um, power supply that can enable you to operate in these shadowed regions for prolonged periods of time and provide that thermal power that you need to do um, any sort of thermal mining or perhaps the electrical power for the mechanical separation. Um, so there's a lot of um, complexity there. And then also if you do want to have, um, for example, these heliostats or, or these multiple landed components, um, that requires multiple launches. It's very, um, very expensive. Um, it may not be particularly, um, you know, normally we want to land in nice flat areas and now we're trying to operate in and around um, crater slopes. So this is why we haven't yet <laughs> done this yet. Um, and also communications with Earth are, are super limited when you're operating in the polar regions of the moon, particularly in a crater. So again, adding that extra layer of complexity to your problem. OK, um, moving on to extraction of oxygen from the regolith, so from the minerals themselves. So I've just got some um, just some diagrams of like the different mineral structures of some common minerals on the moon. And we want to break those those bonds to separate the oxygen, which is a very, very energy intensive process. But the benefit of this is that if you can break the oxygen bonds, you could probably break other bonds as well. So you can draw out different metals um, and use them for infrastructure, for example. There's, instead of just separating one resource, you're separating many resources. And some of these extraction techniques that I'm going to talk about are landing site agnostic. So they can be used in pretty much any type of um, regolith, any type of mix of these um, minerals. Some of them do uh, work best on specific minerals. Um, there's one in particular that I'll touch on, um, but others very much can operate with, with any kind of mineral mix, but you might just tweak your process ever so slightly. Um, I also just want to stipulate that a lot of the different extraction techniques and methods and things that I'm talking about here, these are just um, some, that, some that I've cherry picked from my experiences and interactions with the space resources community. And it is by no means an all-inclusive um, 
uh, highlight reel of all the different techniques that you can use. Um, so uh, please don't send me an angry email if I haven't included yours. Um, okay, so I'm going to start off with hydrogen reduction um, of regolith to extract your oxygen. And the reason I'm going to start with this one is because it was a process that was um, considered uh, relatively early on in sort of the space resources community. Um, it has kind of died out a little bit as advances have been made in other processes. But also this is a reaction that I worked a lot on for my PhD. So I should be annoyingly familiar with this process. Uh, yeah, so hydrogen reduction, hydrogen reduction of regolith is basically where you heat up your regolith and add in hydrogen um, and the hydrogen will reduce the iron oxides in that are present, namely ilmenite, that is the one this reaction works most most efficiently with. And it will, uh, the hydrogen will bond with the oxygen in that oxide and produce your water and you end up with, um, with some iron left and any other waste, any other regular minerals you might have present. Um, so it's, it's nice because it's relatively simple, you just need heat and hydrogen um, and temperatures of around 750 to 1100 degrees C. So you're not reaching the melting point, which is around 1600 degrees C. Um, the hydrogen can actually be recycled. So if you just want the oxygen, you can then electrolyze your water and send that hydrogen back into your system. So having some sort of closed loop um, ability is really important when you're talking about space resources on the moon or Mars, because you don't want to be able, you don't want to be constantly resupplying and having loads of consumables, because um, it kind of defeats the point. Um, but it is quite a low yield process, um, especially if you're going to landing sites that don't have a lot of titanium, which is indicates there's ilmenite present. So you might need to have an extra step beforehand, which we call beneficiation, where you sort of refine your mineral mix and draw out the minerals of interest. Uh, using perhaps some of those um, mechanical techniques that I mentioned earlier um, to draw out the minerals of interest before you then send it through this this process. So this is actually a nice image that um, a friend of mine drew after one of my talks um, during my PhD a few years ago. Um, so for example, you'd you'd send in your ilmenite or your moon rocks or whatever, add your hydrogen, heat it up, and out pops your your iron or, and your titanium dioxide, um, which is the waste from the ilmenite. Um, and then out, out comes your water, which you can collect on some sort of cold trap. So another type of um, separation technique you can use is electrolysis. And there's a couple of different ways you can electrolyze your regolith. Um, the first one is molten regolith electrolysis. So it's in the name, it's molten. Um, and the reason it's molten is because you need there to be some sort of liquid phase for your electrolysis system to be sat in. So what you have is you have an anode and a cathode um, sat in your molten regolith. And because it's molten, it means that the ions, so your metal and your oxygen ions in your metal oxides in your minerals, um, they can freely move. So if you, if you apply an electric potential across your anode and cathode, um, the metal and oxygen ions will separate. So your metal will collect at your cathode um, and that will then um, collect down as a liquid metal at the bottom of your, of your cavity. Um, and then the oxygen, the ions will recombine into O2 and, um, and be released as a gas, which can then be collected. And actually one of the benefits of this technique is you can... Um, increase your electric potential stepwise so that so you can target a specific potential and separate um, a particular metal oxide because they will each require a different amount of energy to separate so you can start off at relatively low potentials and separate those metal oxides collect that metal siphon it off and then increase your electric potential a little bit more and separate a new metal oxide um, so you can actually target um, numerous different metals um, which will all be beneficial in some way for um, forming different um, structures or hardware or whatever on the surface of the moon. Um, and then there's been some recent work being done, um, especially over at, um, in ESA at STEC in the Netherlands, looking at molten salt electrolysis, um, which allows you to do electrolysis of regolith without having to melt it. Instead, the liquid is a um, is a salt mix. So this is a common mixture. I think it's calcium oxide and calcium chloride. 
And instead, your cathode is actually a mesh basket where you would put your regolith into um, and then apply your electric potential between your anode and cathode and your metals will then collect um, and your oxygen will separate. So this is a, a really interesting way of uh, significantly reducing the energy required. Um, but I think there are some increased consumables involved, especially if you have your, um, I think the the anode and cathode can degrade. Um, I think that's a common issue with molten regolith electrolysis as well. Is that that slightly more complex um, process? So it's just how do you, how can you make this process um, require as little human input as possible and as little kind of resupply mission as possible um, to generate some really uh, useful quantities of oxygen? Um, there is another process that I I haven't really um, looked at in much detail, but I wanted to mention it mention it anyway and that is vapor phase pyrolysis where you're talking really high temperatures um so you're heating it to you know around 2000 degrees c um in under vacuum and that effectively dissociates the oxygen from the metals which can then be collected so very energy intensive there's a lot more detail in this um, really great review paper that i'd recommend by schluter and cowley looking at um different oxygen extraction techniques from regolith So just now, um, I want to finish up on this section looking at the um, different access and power issues that come with um, extracting oxygen from just the dry regolith on the moon. Um, so generally, I suppose with the electrolysis um, especially, you can pretty much target any landing site. Um, so you can go to a really uh, friendly place to land as far as that goes on the moon. So in somewhere nice and flat, direct line of communication with Earth. Um, but some of your techniques you might want to target, for example, an, a high ilmenite location. So this is a titanium map of the moon, which shows you the, the red areas um, indicate there'll be high ilmenite concentrations or higher ilmenite concentrations. And if you need to, you may need to add some beneficiation steps um, to your extraction process. Um, and then power. There is still a power issue when it comes to extracting resources from dry regolith. Um, because you need relatively high temperatures, much higher than what you need to extract ice from the poles. Um, but you do have access to a lot more solar power. So you can you could use maybe solar concentrators to directly melt your, your regolith. You could use higher power microwaves to do some of your, um, your, to get your regolith to these higher temperatures, or even some laser heating. There's a number of different techniques you can use. But it is really important to remember that you have 14 days of sunlight in the equatorial regions of the moon, followed by 14 days of night. So what are you going to do in those 14 days? Um, do you have enough energy um, storage, electrical energy storage, perhaps, um, to operate your extraction method during the, the lunar night? Um, or do you need to power down your oxygen extraction system um, and don't operate it for 50% of the time and then have to power it back up again, which isn't a very efficient process. So um, there is no ideal solution here. There's lots of issues involved um, that must be overcome. Um, right, so now I wanna look at some of the examples of some of the really cool um, technology that's been going on in all the different phases of um, space resources and oxygen extraction technologies. So there are a number of prospectors heading to the moon in the very near future. And the goal of these prospecting technologies is generally to better understand the material. So if we can head to the polar regions of the moon and better understand some of these icy deposits, we can better design the ice extraction uh, technologies. So we've got Prime 1 coming up, um, which will be a a commercial lunar payload service mission or CLIPS mission. And this is going to fly on an intuitive machines lander. Um, it's going to land near Shackleton Crater, so um, near to a shadowed region, but it is still an illuminated region. Um, so there is not going to be any surface ice, but there may be buried ice. And some of the key tools that are going to be used here are the Trident drill, uh, which is going to drill down um, and it will um, release some of those drill cuttings into a pile on the surface. And then um, 
that pile of regolith is going to be analyzed with the mSolo um, payload and hopefully tell us if there's any buried ice present. And then following on from that, we've got the Viper uh, rover mission, um, which will hopefully be next year. Another CLIPS mission uh, flying on the astrobotic or landing on the astrobotic Griffin lander. And then the Viper rover is then going to explore um, multiple different regions, which is a huge benefit of being being on a rover instead of just a very uh, fixed landing site. So you can see how the material changes across um, a certain area. So this is going to be heading to the Nobel region of the moon, South Pole. Um, and the benefit is it, it can go into shadowed regions as well as the illuminated region. So it can um, charge up and then um, go and explore for a few hours into the shadowed craters um, do some analyses and then come out to recharge, which is a, a major step forward um, from testing in the illuminated areas alone. Again, this is going to have a Trident drill um, and those samples will be analysed uh, with the Nervous and M-Solo payloads. Um, another one I'd like to mention um, to keep it not too US focused um, is uh, an ESA payload called Prospect and this is a payload that I've been involved in so I'm, I'm on the Prospect science team and this was a payload originally destined to fly on the Roscosmos lander the Luna 27 mission but since ESA and Roscosmos have, um, have cut ties this payload is now going to be flying on a CLIPS mission uh, which we are very grateful for <laughs> um, and on board we have a Proceed drill which um, instead of depositing drill cuttings on the surface, it actually will collect some regolith from different uh, from different depths and deposit it into one of these miniature ovens. So there's like a carousel of, of miniature ovens inside the analysis suite, which is called Prosper. So they can heat up the regolith and then there's some mass spectrometers on board that can hopefully detect any water that's present. So it will be in an illuminated region, but um, hopefully um, they might be able to detect some buried ice. Um, and then another type of mission I wanted to mention, this is just an example because it is recent, um, is prospecting can also involve understanding the mineral composition, not just searching for ice, but un better understanding the mineral composition and how that may change in different areas of the moon. So the recent um, Indian mission, the Chandrayaan-3, a uh, very successful um, mission with the lander and the rover. Um, this was in a south polar region, still illuminated, um, with some payloads on the rover um, that can um, help us understand some of the chemical and mineral composition of the regolith. Um, so now that's looking at understanding um, understanding the material better. And next I want to talk about demonstrators and demonstrating some ex extraction technologies. So there is actually going to be an ISRU demonstrator um, on the moon in a few years time. And this is actually also with the prospect payload. And this is actually what my PhD was focused on. So yes, prospect is hoping to detect water ice in the, in the regolith. And my task as part of my research was what other ISRU experiments could we do with this payload? So Prospect actually has some um, small amounts of gases that are used as reference gases for um, calibrating some of the uh, mass spectrometers on board. So if we've got um, a heater and we've got hydrogen, we can do hydrogen reduction of regolith. Um, is this designed and optimized for this reaction? No. Would I recommend doing it otherwise? Probably not. But it's bonus bonus experiments and kind of bonus um, lessons that we can learn um, because we are not going to a high titanium region, I don't think. Um, so this isn't going to generate huge amounts of water, especially because we're only talking 45 milligram samples here. But it will be the first time we've hopefully, if it works, um, if that we have made water and and um, and extracted that oxygen on the moon um, as an alternative to water ice, and actually in, in my experiments it was able we were able to show that even with very minimal quantities of ilmenite you can still extract um, and detect uh, water generated from this experiment. So we're hopeful. <laughs> Um, and then other types of demonstrators that I want to talk about are 
some of the developments that have been made um, in field testing some of this to scale technology um, here on Earth. So there was um, some hydrogen reduction um, demonstrators that were tested in Hawaii on some basaltic material, which is often seen as a somewhat crude analog for lunar, lunar regolith. And they were able to process about eight to 10 kilogram batches of, um, of regolith and producing, again, low efficiencies, as, as mentioned, you know, one to two weight percent of oxygen from that. Um, but I think that focus has since shifted to other types of um, extraction techniques over the last few years. Um, and now there's actually a lot of funding. Um, there's a number of different challenges that I wanted to just highlight. So, for example, there's the NASA What's on the Moon Challenge, which is looking at addressing this issue of um, distributing energy and storing energy um, so that we can solve some of these access and power issues in the polar craters. Um, so at the moment, last I read, um, there were four winners of the level two stage of work um, that are going to be progressing onto the, the next level. Here's just some examples from a couple of different teams um, involved in that. Uh, there's a really fun one I've been following recently, the Break the Ice Challenge. Um, I think some have been more successful than others, um, which is looking at some of the excavation technologies that we might need to um, dig out some of the 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 ice and the icy regolith to then process um, and also withstand some of the harsh environmental conditions and I believe recently I think up to 15 teams now uh, are going through the are testing their level two prototypes um, so these are just some from the last couple of weeks some imagery um, now, finally, I just wanted to touch on some of the scaling up efforts and some of the talking about a lot of problems. We have a lot of problems that we need to solve. Um, but yeah, so this is a really nice example of some um, scaled up technology that was tested um, out in Spain uh, using so an array of solar reflectors to uh, heat some regular simulant and melt it. Just to show the scale, the sheer scale of um, of infrastructure that's going to be required to heat up regolith to these kinds of high temperatures. And I believe, I think they were looking at some reduction, um, gaseous reduction techniques with this. Um, but yeah, if we want to uh, launch this and send this to the moon, it's gonna be, it's gonna be, take a lot of work and a lot of money, I believe. Um, and then as well, I just wanted to mention again, the the multiple components and logistics of getting some of this um, on the moon. Okay, so this is a nice example. We've got um, our uh, ice collect or water vapor collection tent here, which are being illuminated by these solar reflectors. We've got the ice haulers that are going to collect the ice and transport it to your um, to your site where you where you'll then utilize it. Um, but yeah, multiple different components. Um, this is another study um, that's that's being done for the aquafactorum process where you've got your harvesters um, and then your water cleanup and electrolysis unit. Then you've got the actual um, to create your propellant to then launch your supplies um, off of the lunar surface. So many different steps that and loads of different problems for teams around the world to solve. Um, and being able to move across these different types of terrains and environments. Um, but it's all good fun and totally worth it, right? That's that's why we're here. <laughs> um, okay, so th the last the last thing I wanted to mention here is just the questions that you might want to ask yourself when choosing which of these methods you might use um, to source your oxygen. Uh, the first is, uh, where are your resources going to be used? So where is the ideal place where you want your launch site um, or your your lunar base for your crew? Um, because you don't want your extraction methods, say, to extract ice if you're going to be having your moon base and your launch pad um, in the equatorial regions. Um, but preferably, if, if you're not too fussed about where they're used, then you can move your base to your, your resources, which is also fine. Um, how much power do you have access to and how much do you need? So, yep, yeah, solar power, radioisotopes, um, do you have access through the lunar day and through the lunar night? Um, what resources are available locally? Um, 
do you have access to consumables so if you if you are only going to have access to a certain number of kilograms of resources resupplied to you from earth per year how is that going to dictate what extraction process you use does the process need to be autonomous so does it need to have a crew to support its operation or is it entirely um, capable of being operating and generating the oxygen and the rocket fuel that you need um, without anyone there um, and then how do you, the local conditions affect the process for example as I mentioned the day night cycles and the extreme um, temperature conditions within the shadowed regions and then how many landed components are needed and where do they need to be so realistically are you going to be able to fund um, the multiple launches um, and land landings and transfer of infrastructure across the lunar surface um, and yeah if, if that is a, a viable option um, for you uh, okay right I think I'm going to leave it at that um, pretty much on my 45 minute time so um, I'll stop sharing <laughs> Great talk, Hannah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, everybody, do remember put some questions in the Q and A if you have them. Uh, we do have a couple, so I will start with the the one submitted first. Um, on slide eighteen, a quote cold finger uh. at ne <laughs> at yeah. negative eighty degrees Celsius is indicated. What pressure does that have to operate at? So, oh, okay. So I, this is a throwback to my PhD time. Um, I'm sure there was a reason. Um, I think, so we were operating under vacuum, um, a few tens of millibar. But if you look at a, um, a phase diagram of water, and so if you are restricted by a certain pressure, then you can use that phase diagram to tell you what temperature you need to be less than to uh, to condense your your water um, so you need to really get familiar with your um, water phase diagrams but I can't remember off the top of my head I'm afraid <laughs> awesome I will mark that as answered um, someone says thanks great talk I was wondering how feasible is the hydrogen reduction process of regolith in regards to the prospect mission Oh, it's a totally terrible idea, but we're doing it anyway. Because um, <laughs> so the prospect mission isn't designed to do this. Okay, it's designed to um, uh, detect volatiles that might be present. Okay, so the team is very good at producing mass spectrometers that can detect these small amounts of water. Um, it's more of a bonus. Um, yeah, why not? Awesome. Um, another person says, amazing presentation. Thank you. Um, and I agree. Now, I guess I'll take host's prerogative here um, and ask a question I had. What do you think has the best potential for scaling up and should and or should be one of the first things we try to implement during our operations on the lunar surface? Yeah. Oh, the million dollar question, probably the billion dollar question, really. Um, I think we have to go as simple as possible, even if it's heavy and messy and whatever. Um, don't over engineer it. Um, so I think if we can do. I think reflected or solar power, even just with one reflector and one. You know, one heated tent or whatever um just start just start small um i think solar power is is the most viable option but yeah i'm interested to see the, some of this electrolysis to be honest i think that has the potential to be the most efficient way of doing it but it is complex but i i would like to see that one i just don't see how it how that will play out without having the crew and the consumables to kind of keep it running continually Makes sense. Thank you. Um, let's see. I don't see any others in the chat. Well, I assume people are typing because this was an amazing talk and informative <laughs> talk. Um, I did want to remind people this will be uploaded to YouTube as well um, on the AIAA Space Resources uh, YouTube channel. Um, and I will also be uploading the slides to AIAA Engage. It's You do have to make an account, but it's free. 
Um, and I'll be posting it in the public forum. So if you have any questions on that, please feel free to reach out for how to actually access any of these things. Um, one comment in the Q&A, great work, agreed. <laughs> um, I don't see anything else popping up. We'll wait just a couple of minutes, but did you have any closing comments you wanted to make? Anything like that? Um, not necessarily. I guess um, I very much have taken the approach with this talk just to kind of give um, that baseline, um, I suppose, context, because I know there is a lot of really great work coming up at the moment. Loads of um, engineering teams working on some really niche problems involved in this whole um, chain that needs to be met in order to get to, you know, creating these meaningful amounts of resources on the moon. Um, but I think it's easy to lose touch of uh the bigger the, the the bigger scale and the bigger problem that we're trying to um trying to address so i hope it's been of some help anyway i'm sure i know it has been very informative for me we did have one pop up in the q a um how much hydrogen do you need for your h2 reduction processes and how does this compare to the amount of hydrogen you would expect to be retained in the regolith from the solar wind yeah so uh it's not a huge amount of um, hydrogen and the, the, as I said earlier, the, the hydrogen can actually be recycled. Um, I think it's, uh, it's, I think it's probably like a one-to-one -one process, one-to-one uh, -one reaction or, or something a lot on that sort of order. Um, and actually, yeah, you can hypothetically harvest the hydrogen from the regolith. So the solar wind is constantly, um, releasing protons that are being embedded onto the the surface of the regolith which is basically what hydrogen is so we can potentially harvest that but the thing is hydrogen is super light it's the lightest element so launching hydrogen from earth isn't a huge isn't as big of an issue say as, as launching more heavy materials um and because it's recycled it's not that that um that problematic to just bring with you the the amount that you need for that reaction um so is it worth going through the effort of harvesting hydrogen from the regolith i don't know um maybe um but it is definitely something that 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 you know these these teams are aware of and have considered cool um i don't see any oh here we go another one great presentation i was wondering what happens at the hydrogen and maybe what happens to the hydrogen and maybe water vapor gas after the reaction? Do you collect them or do you release them outside? Yeah, so um, imagine these reactions are generally going to happen in a closed system, um, especially on the moon. If you don't do it in a closed system, it's probably just going to, uh, you're going to lose most of most of your uh, useful resources. So you add your hydrogen um, and then water is produced in the gaseous phase um, and then if you have a cold surface or a cold finger, as we call it, um, that water will ultimately condense there. Um, so actually, the reason we had minus 80 was because we were trapping not just water, but other other gases that we might have produced. We just wanted to see if we had any other gases like CO2 or something. So that's why we had that temperature, I think. Um, anyway, so, yeah, so you collect your water. Um, and then you can seal off, basically seal off your cold finger separate it out and then you've got a little canister of water um, which you can then send through an electrolysis process which is a very common process now um, very um, off-the-shelf technology um, to separate your oxygen and then feed your hydrogen back into your your, your system awesome um one thing I did forget to mention is uh, thank you for joining, by the way. This talk, I know we started at 9 p.m. Uh, yeah, it's, local it's, time. <laughs> it's getting late. Um, it's a bit darker here than it is over there, I presume. <laughs> yeah. So thank you very much for joining. Um, I'll wait another couple of seconds for something to pop into the chat. Otherwise, um, I think we can let you have an awesome rest of your night. <laughs> um, what's left of it anyway. No, um, thank and thank you, everybody, so for joining. Um, Hannah, thank you for a very good and informative talk. Um, and we will see you all next month for next month's webinar. Stay tuned for the announcement in the beginning of October.
Thank you, everyone. Bye, everyone. Thanks.